I'm really delighted to see so many people here uh, to hear Peter Schuck talk. Um, and I particularly want to thank uh, the law students who, who came um, at exam period, because I know from my son's experience that this is a particularly um, stressful time for you. So uh, it's great to see such a great crowd. Um, before I introduce Peter Schock, I just want to introduce um, another person in the audience, because we have um, here the two people I would put at the very top of my list for brilliant law and politics scholars. One is Peter Schock, and the other is Robert Kagan from Berkeley, uh, who is very embarrassed. <laughs> uh, that he, I mean, he's got a surprise and embarrassed I mentioned this, but I, but, but uh, Bob had re recently retired from Berkeley, where he taught for many years in law school in the political science department. Um, some of you have read his work on adversarial legalism. And I just wanted to introduce him to people here because he's a great resource. He's uh, not really interested in doing a lot of teaching anymore or grading of papers, but uh, um, I hope that people uh, in the law school faculty will get to know him um, and he can participate in some of the events here. I'm not going to read <coughs> Peter Schuck's resume because it's about 21 pages. Um, but I will put it that uh, he know, some of you know him from various works. Um, the undergraduates who are in my, uh, law, uh, my politics and policy class will know him as the author of Why Government Fails So Often and How It Can Do Better. Um, some of you might have seen him on the John Stewart Show um, talking about the book. Uh, my grad students will know him as the co-editor of the really wonderful collection of essays, Understanding America. Um, those of you uh, who teach in the law school and teach torts will know him as one of the country's leading tort experts, uh, the author of Agent Orange on Trial, which is, I think, one of the best case studies ever written on a, on a mass toxic tort case. Others will know you, and Dan and others will know him as an expert on immigration law. He's written several books on immigration law. Still others will know him as an expert on administrative law. And for those of you uh, who um, are a bit older will remember that he wrote the seminal book called Suing Government on Liability of Public Officials. Um, what you probably didn't know um, was in addition to having a law degree, he also uh, did graduate work in government back when the Harvard Government Department taught things that were interesting. Um, he was a Nader's Raider, uh, wrote a book on the Judiciary Committee. Um, and he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Evaluation in the Department of HEW um, uh, in the Jimmy Carter administration. Uh, so he has been involved uh, 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 in politics, um, in administration. He's uh, studied politics as well as law. Um, and that gives him really a unique opportunity to talk to us about um, not only why government fails so often and how it can do better, but maybe how law professors um, and political science professors can do a little bit better educating our students who will eventually go into government. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Peter Schuck. Thanks, Jeff. It's, it's wonderful uh, to be here and, and particularly to uh, help to preside at a marriage, I hope, between law and, uh, and political science and public policy. Um, that would be a, that would be a three people, a ménage à trois, I don't I, uh, But um, anyway, it'd be, it'd be a very good thing. Uh, Shep is really, I think, the leading figure in political science attempting to bring those two worlds together. And uh, his, his initial book, which is how I met him, uh, about the Clean Air Act is, is still a seminal uh, work, uh, although it's now over 30 years old. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is a marriage that uh, really needs uh, to be nurtured. And I, I, it's not obvious to me why it is so difficult uh, to bring about this sort of uh, synthesis, but, uh, but it is. It doesn't happen very often. And as Shep said, uh, Bob Kagan is one of the very few social scientists uh, with a great interest in law, and there are re remarkably few law professors who uh, who venture out of their their silo. Um, and again, I don't I don't understand why that is because these intersections are so important and so interesting, and they open so many avenues to scholarship to creative scholarship. 
Um, now, Shep asked me to uh, talk about the uh, role of lawyers in government, and the particular challenges that confront lawyers in government, uh, as well as to talk about my book. And I, I'm not sure how many of you are at the law school and how many of you are at the uh, political science or social science end of things. How many of you, particularly the students, how many of you uh, are at the law school? Okay. All right, not that many. They'll, well, maybe I should give shorter shrift to that, uh, that part. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm here to please, so whatever, whatever you want. Uh, but I would like to leave a lot of time for a Q&A if, if, I, if, I, uh, if I can do that. So I wrote this article uh, about 15 years ago, and frankly, uh, coming up on the, in the car on the way from New York this morning is the first time I looked at it since then. Um, but I, uh, as I look back on it, um, uh, it's, it's an article that was part of a symposium on lawyers in government that was uh, orchestrated by law and contemporary problems at the Duke University. And as I looked it over again, it, it brought back many, many memories of, uh, of the intersections of lawyers and, uh, and non-lawyers in government when I was in the government, uh, but also at other times in my career. As, as uh, Shep said, I, I was a Nader's Raider uh, and uh, spent a couple of years in that world um, in which there was constant interplay between the Raiders. We were all law, either law students or recent graduates of law school um, and, and policymakers. Um, and at that time, it seemed to me uh, <coughs> We were very naive about uh, how government works and how government doesn't work. Um, and uh, I, I subsequently uh, wrote an article about Nader. It was the first thing I ever wrote, actually, it was published in the Texas Law Review, which was a review of three books about Nader. And that was published in 1972, just to date myself uh, in an embarrassing fashion. And. Um, I look back at that as uh, somewhat insightful, but, but, but basically not nearly as uh, sophisticated as uh, it should have been um, because of our constant interactions with government, but in a very adversarial mode uh, without much effort to understand what was actually going on under the hood, as it were. <clears throat> um, and then as I spent more time uh, around government and uh, <clears throat> served in the government, um, not a particularly successful government, I should add, uh, during the Carter administration, uh, I began to see uh, how legal training uh, could facilitate an understanding of uh, the outputs of government and, and the, uh, the process of government, um, and, but also how uh, blind legal education seemed to be to the imperatives of preparing young lawyers for uh, for, pub for public service, but even if, in, if they were in private law uh, or the private sector, uh, for understanding what actually uh, goes on under the hood, to use that cliche for a second time in three minutes. Um, and, and so uh, I, I welcomed the opportunity when Law and Contemporary Problems came to me to ask if I would participate in this symposium to reflect on these, on these uh, interactions and uh, and. So I, I used a couple of incidents from my career at, at uh, DHEW, now HHS, uh, minus education. Um, in particular, the preparation of uh, government-wide regulations uh, for the implementation of Section 504 under the Disabilities Act, which uh, came to be a very, very important uh, piece of uh, public policy, which Shep uh, has written about extensively in his work. Um, and then also the sequel to the, des the desegregation uh, order issued by the courts in a very famous case called Adams versus Califano, which was a case that required the dismantling of the dual system of higher education in the South. And I, I don't know um, if you haven't read the article, and I guess if they're lost, if just a couple of law students, uh, most of you have not read the article, and I don't want to go over it in, in much detail, uh, but 
what I observed from those interactions was that the lawyers in the office of uh, general counsel at HEW were outstanding lawyers uh, uh, by any account, um, really were disabled, I think, from making the kinds of contribution to the solution of these very difficult problems, particularly in the desegregation uh, context, uh, where they had a court order, and the only question was how that court order was going to be implemented. Uh, I say the only question, but it was an extraordinarily difficult question, in part because the court had not given much guidance as to what dismantling a dual system meant, and in part because um, the, uh, the secretary ha had, uh, had broad discretion to figure out how to, how to do this. So, um, again, I was struck by how unhelpful in some ways the lawyers were in assisting uh, our side, which is the policy-making side, um, in, in solving this, this extremely difficult uh, problem. So why, why were they disabled? Why did they not make more of a contribution uh, than they should have? And I emphasize, as I do in the article, that these are very, very talented lawyers. They were well-educated. They were smart. They uh, had a detailed understanding of the law. They knew how to read cases. They knew how to synthesize uh, lines of authority. Um, but they were, to use the cliche, another cliche, very legalistic, very formalistic about uh, what the law Required. They were excellent at reading cases. They were excellent at uh, uh, um, identifying um, what the scope of uh, legal authority was and so forth, but they were very uncreative when it came to understanding the deep nature of the problem of dismantling uh, this uh, system. Let me tell you just a little bit about the system of just you know, a minute uh, uh, of context. Uh, under the Second Moral Act, the First Moral Act uh, that was passed in 1862 uh, under, uh, in, in the Lincoln administration and uh, established the system of land-grant colleges. And it's one of the great success stories that I mentioned in my Why Government, Work, uh, Why Government Fails So Often and How to Make It, How It Can Do Better. Uh, I have a chapter on successes, and the First Moral Act is one of those successes. Um, in fact, there are several... Uh, successes in the Lincoln administration. One is the other one was the Homestead Act. Um, but there was a second moral act. Most people don't know. But it was the same senator from, uh, uh, I believe, it's from New York, um, uh, Justin Morrow. Maybe he was from Michigan. I'm not sure. Vermont. Vermont? From Vermont was he? Okay, it's close to New Hampshire, so he knows. <laughs> Vermont, New Hampshire. They're all they're both. <laughs> um, and the second Moral Act, which was enacted in, in uh, 1890, uh, created the, a dual system of land-grant colleges. That is to say, the blacks who uh, were to attend these colleges or to be served by the colleges uh, entered one system and the, and the whites the other. It was a sep separate but equal, though the equality was uh, far from having been achieved in fact. And these, these institutions are extremely important, not just because they educated uh, a black youth, but because they also serve the, the agricultural uh, workers um, and worked on the development of scientific uh, enterprises uh, in their geographical areas. Uh, so the, the black land-grant colleges and, and then the black institutions, the historically black institutions, uh, which arose in their wake, which were not state-owned colleges, but uh, Morehouse and, uh, and, and many other colleges that are justly esteemed today, developed their own system with their own faculty, their own uh, uh, sources of uh, research and, and so forth. And they did a spectacular job given the challenge that they faced uh, during the uh, during the period after the Second Moral Act occurred. And indeed, to a considerable extent, the <coughs> black middle class today uh, consists to a disproportionate degree of um, graduates of the, black, the historically black institutions. Some of them land-grant colleges and others not. Um, 
So that system, uh, although uh, developed in the shadow of <coughs> Plessy versus Ferguson and, and uh, separate but equal, um, uh, created a very rich fabric of social uh, community and educational life uh, for the black community. So when this lawsuit came around, uh, and it was a fairly easy case to win, obviously, because uh, the, the dual systems had been established uh, back in the Plessy versus Ferguson era and um, had, uh, had been as segregated as institutions could be, even after Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the, the lawyers went in, they sued, um, and they won an easy victory. So the question was, well, what do we do now? We have the, we have the court order. Uh, how do we implement the court order? How do we dismantle the, the dual system? Well, what struck me was that the lawyers had no sense of the institutional and cultural and market context in which this problem had to be confronted and, and solved. They did not seem to understand, uh, despite our efforts to explain it to them, that uh, this, this set of institutions had grown up uh, and created a market that uh, was very important to the black students and the black farmers and other black interests that had benefited from this, um, and that in a unified system, they would be severely disadvantaged. Indeed, most of those institutions would not be able to survive. And although the unification plan, if designed in a particular way, uh, would uh, integrate the faculty and administrators of the, of the black institutions, uh, they probably would not be able to compete in terms of credentials with, the, with their white counterparts. So they'd lose their jobs, they'd lose their sources of income, and the institutions themselves would wither uh, and, and perhaps die. Um, as I say, the, the lawyers uh, understood the precedents and they understood the, uh, the legal uh, uh, apparatus uh, that was relevant to addressing this problem, but they had no sense at all, nor I must say a lot of interest in confronting these extremely daunting uh, implementation problems. Um, and uh, those of you who study in political science know that implementation is sort of one of the dark corners of uh, political science. Uh, there is a small group of people, including Professor Melnick, uh, who uh, takes implementation problems seriously uh, these are often uh, people who study political science in the shadow of Aaron Moldowski and Jeff Pressman's uh, seminal work uh, about, um, about implementation in Oakland. Uh, but most political scientists don't have a lot of interest in what goes on after the legislation or the policy leaves Washington. <clears throat> and, um, and that was true, that was very much true, I think, of, of the lawyers with whom we interacted uh, at uh, at the Office of General Counsel. And these were, as I say, great lawyers. And the head of the office was uh, David Tatel, who was a DC Circuit judge, uh, himself a, a remarkable person, blind, uh, a fantastic lawyer, and, uh, and a great judge. Uh, but he, too, had been trained in this relatively narrow fashion uh, of uh, legal, legal formalism um, that emphasized certain aspects of, uh, of, of, of legal uh, legal universe and ignored others outside that, uh, that universe. <coughs> so my basic point, and I've probably gone on too long about this, my basic point was we had all these talented people, all these great resources that had been trained at uh, some of the best law schools in America, including BC, uh, but they couldn't contribute much to the solution of the real problem. They were able to muster the precedents and, and draft the orders and issue, excuse me, issue regulations, uh, but they, they were sort of blind to uh, the institutional frameworks and the history and the, uh, the cultural uh, issues and the economic forces that were operating on these institutions that threatened to, uh, uh, to extinguish them uh, in, in their moment of, uh, of victory. So why is that? It was certainly true of my training at Harvard Law School in the Middle Ages. And uh, I met Fred Lewis here today. We hadn't seen each other in 50 years. And uh, he, he, he uh, 
uh, went into political science uh, rather than uh, in law, uh, staying in law. And uh, I think it had a lot to do with the curriculum. Uh, it had a lot to do with the mindset of the law professors with whom uh, we studied, um, who were not, who were, I think, isolated from uh, the policy world. When I say that, I, I, there's, there's a risk that I will exaggerate. Obviously, lawyers understand uh, that, uh, that the laws um, uh, require difficult choices to be made uh, among uh, competing objectives, and the uh, laws have costs, and they impose costs, and they generate benefits, and there are distributional issues, and there are implementation and institutional issues that have to be understood if one is to appreciate the, the, the rich context in which law is delivered. Um, Nevertheless, the emphasis was very, very uh, limited and, and, and clear that it was law that you were to study and not the, not the rest. Uh, despite the fact that I think that the, the, the integument that, that, that ought to link law and policy and does link law and policy in the real world um, uh, is, is so obvious. Uh, now, I, don't, I suspect that that's not as true today as it was then. I'm sure it was... It, it, uh, today, there's a great deal more interest in law schools in broadening the horizons of uh, law students, um, particularly those who intend to go into uh, public law. There's a lot more emphasis, certainly, an enormously greater emphasis today on economic analysis uh, than there was then. It was hardly mentioned uh, in, uh, in the class of 1965 at Harvard Law School. Um, and social science is uh, much more uh, much more prominent in the in, in the debates over uh, over uh, public policy, and uh, so we've certainly come a long way, I think, in terms of our social appreciation of the importance of, the, of this intersection. But uh, the law school curriculum, law school curriculums, even at my institution, Yale Law School, is from the perspective that I'm. Advocating here, fair, still fairly narrow. Uh, not many students uh, take a joint uh, uh, take courses at the public policy schools. Not many take courses in economics. Uh, now they're well educated. They come to uh, Yale with uh, with extraordinary uh, academic uh, training. So I'm not suggesting that they're unacquainted with these uh, with, with these issues. But when they go to law school, they kind of narrow their horizons and they plunge ahead. And of course, we live in a world of specialization, which the big payoffs are in specialists uh, today. And there's very, very little uh, payoff for trying to make the very tragic trade-offs between being a deep specialist and, and being somebody who, who looks broadly uh, across a variety of uh, disciplines. It has its satisfactions, to be sure. And I like to think that that's uh, the way I've designed my own career, although it sounds more rational and, uh, and, 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 and more um, uh, synoptic uh, than, uh, than it actually was. A lot of it was sort of adventitious, uh, 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 accidental, and so forth. But anyway, it's worked out that way, and, and, and it's very, very satisfying. But um, uh, that's, not where, that's not where the money is. That's not where the academic prestige is uh, today. And certainly, law students uh, need to make very difficult choices in deciding how they're going to do design their careers. Particularly if you go to going to law firms, where you're going to be um, you're, you're going to be pushed into uh, very narrow uh, specialties, uh, which may or may not satisfy you, may or may not uh, create uh, the kinds of career paths that uh, that you think you want now. Uh, but it's uh, it, it will it will certainly limit you. Uh, and so if you're going to avoid that, you really need to struggle against that set of pressures and, and, uh, and professional imperatives. Um, so I, 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 I'm tempted to, to uh, stop uh, here as far as that, is, that theme, that set of uh, points is concerned, and uh, ask if there are any questions, and then, uh, and then uh, go on to uh, the book. No challenges. I hope I'm wrong. By the way, I hope I, I hope that uh, that BC Law School uh, uh, defies my uh, description. Um, <laughs>
but I, I sort of doubt it. I, I just based on, not my experience at BC, but my own experience with, with excellent uh, law schools. Zig? Um, I, my memory of, of law school in the 60s was that some professors just wanted to dance angels on the head of a pin, uh, also in the poli sci department. Uh, but that functionality was also relevant. Um, and uh, a bunch of us like you, um, although you came from a school nearer to, to here, with more angels dancing on the head of a pin. But uh, when you went to Washington, when you went to the Nader's Raiders, you were just doing something that a lot of law students wanted to do. Um, here today, uh, our students are facing a job market that is incredibly tougher than when, when you and I graduated. And yet here at BC, over the past couple of years, uh, the students very often have jumped in on projects, working with the Navajo, working uh, with immigrants in Haiti. Uh, as we did with the Exxon Valdez, the students here jumped in and did research projects, by the way, with a couple of poli sci people and people from the main campus, on, on the, uh, the BP Deepwater Horizon blowout. Uh, students um, a couple of months ago went up to Alaska to work with India. The, the trouble is the system that they're going into is, I think, more constraining now. So many of them feel that they have to do this functional public service while they're students, but when they get out, they have to do something for at least five or six years or ten years uh, to pay off the huge debts that we uh, have, have mobilized for them. But I think they want to do things the functionality, I think, uh, uh, is, is, is what they want to do, unlike those lawyers who are formalistic and, 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 and so narrow that we've all worked with, uh, but the context Well, I want to push back on, uh, on you uh, to, to some extent. Uh, if you recall back in 1965, when I graduated from law school, there was really no public <laughs> interest work to speak of, except for civil rights. That was, that was important. Uh, but that was also a time of black power, uh, and uh, the, the opportunities for white lawyers, uh, other than Jack Greenberg, uh, to, uh, to work in that area were, were, were somewhat limited. The explosion of public interest organizations and civil society groups devoted to a vast array of, uh, uh, of efforts to improve uh, the quality of uh, our society uh, that explosion had not, did not occur until, uh, until later on. There are vastly more positions in the nonprofit, se in the nonprofit sector today than there were then, vastly more. Now, of course, there's a lot of competition for those jobs, and uh, uh, it, it, we live in a more competitive time today. There's no question about that. Uh, but I, 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 I want to harken back to those days when uh, with the exception of civil rights organizations and in the late uh, 60s, beginning of the environmental movement uh, and uh, public interest law, um, there were very few opportunities unless one were extraordinarily entrepreneurial and, and sort of devised one's path by oneself. So I'm not so sure. A very large number of my students go into a variety of, uh, of NGOs and uh, that seems, there seems to be a lot of interest in that. Now, can they earn the kind of money that they can earn law firms? Obviously not, uh, but I think uh, the satisfactions from such a life are still uh, uh, very great. And, uh, and so I'm not sure you're right. It, 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 it is a more competitive world. I have no doubt about that. And uh, the law schools are finding it more difficult to place their graduates in law firms. but. Um, there are lots of other outlets for people who are legally trained who, uh, who want to uh, uh, exercise their skills in creative ways. University administration, universal, the university sector has grown enormously uh, since then, uh, uh, just, just as one example. No, your encouragement is well placed. I encourage you to apply. Dan? I wonder, I want to hear more about your current thing you saw. Try to keep this brief, but I wonder if some of the mindset that you experienced in that particular historical period might ironically have been due to the sort of dominant narrative that it was legal activism and legal thinking that actually won the won the battle, which I think was an incorrect narrative in retrospect. 
was very powerful at the time. And those lawyers who did come out of that came out of it with a sense of the transformative power of law, which may have led them to a false sense of power and, and security in, in later years. Well, I think that's true. I think lawyers, I mean, this is hardly an original observation. Uh, 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 at least since Tocqueville, uh, we've understood that in, in American society, uh, lawyers have, uh, as he called it, a natural aristocracy, uh, are a natural ar aristocracy, and have influence far beyond the level of lawyers in, uh, in other uh, societies. So I think there's always been a sense of efficacy and, and, and political heft uh, 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 among the legal profession here. But you're quite right that it, during that period, but again, it was a little bit after I was in law school, uh, there was this uh, efflorescence of, efflorescence of um, public interest law uh, efforts uh, that greatly expanded uh, our horizons. Now, but my critique would still apply uh, to those organizations because uh, my view is, and you may disagree with me on this, and, and, my, and this is a nice segue actually into my book, um, I think lawyers who are excellent uh, advocates and litigators are often very poor policy designers and implement, implementers. They don't look beyond the legal materials to, to, uh, uh, to analyze in a relatively rigorous way what the consequences of various choices will be. Um, and uh, here, here's an example, and this is a controversial one, so I'm sure some of you will want to push back on this. One of the other great successes that I recount in, uh, in my book, on, on my chapter on successes, is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We all know, or should know, uh, that this is one of the great transformative uh, legal uh, uh, developments in our history. Um, uh, for any for any number of reasons, so there's no, there's no really no question about that, and it's also no question that uh, that this was a very hard won victory. That it was not by any means, as we all know, if, if you have even a smattering of knowledge of the civil rights movement, uh, one of lawyers was led uh, by people who were prepared to risk their lives uh, to uh, to vindicate uh, principles of equality and define equality. Um, but lawyers played an important role in it, um, and uh, there's no question that the leadership exercised by lawyers through the NAACP Legal and Education Fund and, uh, and other organizations uh, were able to consolidate the victories. Well, then, what did, what, did, what did we do with those victories? Well, um, once blacks were able to vote, uh, there were a series of other impediments uh, to their exercising their votes in a, in a politically effective way. So there was a second generation of cases once the right to vote was established, uh, which attempted to dismantle certain uh, voting structures that, um, that uh, tended to dilute uh, black voting power. Well, uh, that was all also very important work that was led by the Inc. Fund. Uh, but then there was a third generation of cases starting in the uh, 1980s, which I think has had a generally uh, uh, unfortunate uh, consequence uh, for blacks uh, and also for our uh, legal system. And that was the uh, insistence that uh, in order to protect black voting rights, it was necessary to create black, safe black seats uh, by engineering and that's exactly what it was, uh, by, through racial gerrymandering, which was orchestrated by the courts uh, at, the, uh, at the behest of the Inc. Fund and, and other uh, organizations that had done a spectacular job in generations one and generations two. I think uh, had they talked more to political scientists, uh, they might have understood better than they did uh, that the consequences of these racially gerrymandered districts would be to strengthen the Republican Party in the legislature, would be to uh, um, uh, create safe seats for black politicians who were then much freer to ignore the interests of their, uh, of their uh, constituents, and to create a political system uh, which now is very much run by the courts, um, uh, which have very little idea of what they're doing in terms of 
the <clears throat> political consequences of these legalistic uh, decisions. So again, I have no doubt some of you will disagree uh, with me about this and think that on balance uh, uh, this, is, this third generation um, effort is a good one, but I think it's not. And I think, uh, in fact, some, uh, some of the uh, former architects of this uh, system uh, have come to realize that uh, they uh, actually made matters worse for the interests that they uh, most wanted to promote. That's just an example. There are lots of others uh, in, in, in my uh, book um, that suggest that in order to have a, a chance of designing a policy that uh, will have a good outcome as distinguished from making us feel good uh, or vindicating certain abstract principles without regard to their real-world consequences, you have to engage in a very careful, very broad-gauged analysis looking to uh, social science and the methodologies, the techn often technocratic methodologies, to use a, an adjective that uh, seems disparaging but in my view is, is, uh, is not uh, disparaging, uh, uh, technocratic uh, techniques to, uh, to analyze uh, the costs and the benefits and the distribution of those costs and benefits and the magnitudes and the, and the uh, way in which those costs and benefits will uh, uh, work their way into uh, real life. As I tell my students in, in, in very early in my torts case, I said, I say, you're going to analyze what the con likely consequences of a particular decision are, but what you must not do is to think that just because you can identify a group that will benefit in the first interest, in the first instance, or bear a cost in the first instance, uh, that that is the distribution of the relevant costs and benefits. It's not. It's, what, what matters is the way those costs and benefits are distributed through the society once the market works its will. Um, and so you can't satisfy yourself simply by looking at the first, first order impact. You have to look at the second and third and fourth order impact as far as you know, your vision and your resources will permit you uh, to look. These are really hard questions. I'm not suggesting that they're e easy answers or easy techniques for answering them. Uh, but those are the right questions to ask. And I think in law school, um, often uh, those are not the questions that, uh, that we focus on. Bob? Just to follow up on that. Um, whether you've thought about how, how you would try to implement this vision that you're talking about. If, if you were made dean of a, of a law school and you had an unusually compliant faculty, <laughs> and an unusually quiescent but still generous alumni group to deal with, how would you rejigger the curriculum? Who would you hire? Uh, what, you know, what, what, what are the steps you might want to take? All right. Well, the first thing I would <clears throat> first thing I would do would be to look for faculty who have this broader uh, this broader vision, and, and uh, they may not uh, uh, be the same folks who uh, you know clerked on the Supreme Court and uh, and then worked for a year or two in the Justice Department, uh, and then came uh, back to teach. And that, again, it's not to disparage those people; they're extraordinarily talented people. But it's not obvious that that kind of training uh, is what uh, provides the breadth of of interest and vision and and, uh, and uh, technique that is necessary to convey this sort of this sort of understanding to uh, to students. So that's one thing. Recruiting faculty would be would be rather different. Uh, secondly, uh, the curriculum obviously needs to include a lot more um, exposure to uh, to social science and to uh, the methodologies of uh, of policy evaluation. Um, uh, Professor Melnick's course, I, I've, I've seen his, uh, his outline, and uh, I'm featured prominently on it, which, uh, which delights me. Um, but um, that seems to me the kind of course that uh, ought to be offered at uh, law schools. I'm glad it's offered at BC. I know such courses offered at Yale, to, to my knowledge. Um, so that's an example of a, you know, a, a curricular direction uh, that seems to me to be desirable. I would certainly emphasize economics uh, much more than uh, many schools do. Um, 
Uh, at Yale, uh, econo economics is not uh, scanted, uh, so that's not a crit criticism of Yale, uh, but uh, it's, it is a criticism of many other uh, law schools, I think. Um, and uh, much more emphasis on uh, statistics. And uh, those things that, by the way, uh, Justice Holmes, in a famous speech in the 1890s, uh, said really constituted the future of the law. He said the man, he used the, the term man, uh, uh, today I suspect he would, would not have uh, gender, genderized that uh, term. He said the, the future of the law lies in the men of economics and statistics. Um, and I think he was right, and this was, you know, he said this uh, 120, 25 years ago. Would those courses be available or mandatory in law school? Oh, I don't believe much in mandates. I, I, I would certainly use the bully pulpit of my deanship to exhort students to, uh, to take them. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mandate it. At Yale, we don't mandate anything uh, except, for, <laughs> except for the four courses in the first semester. And I think that's, at least with the kinds of students we have, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good system. But I can't speak for other, other schools. Yes? Is there any current international systems that you, is there any current international systems that you uh, find appropriate to model after, maybe Oxford or, the, or specific uh, PPE or PPL yeah. that would funnel? Well, the, yeah, the PPE, the, the PPE uh, uh, curriculum uh, at the at Oxbridge is, is very rich in that respect. Uh, uh, I, but I, I'm not familiar enough to, with the curricula generally to, to answer that question. You had your hand up. Oh, yeah. um, it strikes me that there's an aspect not just of curriculum, but of a lawyer's attitude toward law that is percolating out here. That. Um, I happen, I think all issues revolve around legal ethics, it's my field, and it's over time I've, I see lawyers as having a very much an ownership attitude toward law. We own law, we control it, and the universe revolves around us. We are the center and all things go around. We have unauthorized practice, we exclude the other, and that that You might call it the Copernican view of law. <laughs> yeah. and, and that it, that what you're describing is some of the unintended consequences. So that's one dimension. The second dimension is, I think perhaps if, I would urge you when you become dean and with this uh, compliant faculty and uh, unlimited resources, that the, the, the expansion of clinical and contextual legal education opens up a lot more opportunities for lawyers to stop and think, I, mean, I can talk about the theory of domestic violence and the power of restraining orders and the legal value of restraining orders, but when I'm talking to a client and working on a hotline and have to say that the fact is you're more at danger if you file a restraining order at the time you leave than if you stay. I mean, how can you not tell them the reality of it? So it's often in clinical education that theory meets the messiness of fact. Then a third dimension is the idea I'm of- I'm gonna come back to the clinical And point. training our students to, uh, if it relates to the first point, to be better listeners, being more open to these expertise, better listeners about the realities of problems, and more humility. And maybe what we should be doing, we, that means we as professors, have to become ourselves better listeners and have more humility to the, understand the limits, be a little more Socratic in understanding the limits of our knowledge. And so maybe there's clinic and character education and all that stuff what? too. I certainly applaud your last point. Uh, I think humility is uh, is a virtue in all in all uh, walks of life, uh, and not just uh, law, and uh, not just in in the ministry, uh, but in every area. Um, and you're right. There's something about legal education, but I suspect it's only because that's the area I know best. It may be true in engineering and in medicine as well. I, I, I'm led to believe that it is true in medicine as well. Uh, that uh, causes uh, students uh, to gain a very inflated view of themselves and of the centrality of, of, their, uh, of their mission and professional mission. And maybe that's a good thing so long as it's subsequently tempered uh, by, uh, by greater humility. I want to go back to the clinical point. Now that's, that, that's a, a sea change uh, that occurred after I was in law school. It began, as I understand it, as, uh, as my predecessors at Yale tell me, it began at Yale Law School in the, in the late 60s, I believe. Um, but that may be wrong, but that's the, that's the, that's the, gospel, that's the gospel according to, uh, to, those, uh, to those folks. Um, 
And of course, it's spread enormously, and uh, now any self-respecting law school has uh, a number of, uh, of clinics. Uh, but let me, uh, and I, I applaud all of that, uh, but let me, uh, let me suggest uh, uh, some, ca uh, some cautions, <coughs> not in the development and elaboration of, uh, of clinics, but rather um, I want to draw a connection between the approach that clinical courses usually take to the more general point I made about lawyers and, and public policy. Uh, Dan Kansu uh, may uh, disagree with me about this, and other clinicians may disagree with me about this, but it wouldn't be the first time that Dan and I uh, disagreed. Uh, but, but here's, <laughs> but here's, a, uh, here's a good example. When I come, when I begin my immigration course, I haven't taught it in a while, but uh, when I uh, was teaching immigration law, uh, my class was filled with people who, like me, are fierce advocates of immigration. We all, that's why we're in the course, that's why I entered the field. I'm one of those people who, uh, you know, we, we see the Statue of Liberty, uh, to use a Yiddish uh, word, kvels. Uh, I get goosebumps, um, and I have enormous admiration for the immigrant experience and the, and the, uh, the achievements of immigrants in the United States. I think it's, uh, it's uh, as many people have said, uh, uh, perhaps the most distinctive feature of American society, it's, and one of the most important uh, reasons why we're uh, the greatest society on earth, as I believe we are. Um, but what I say to my students is, okay, we're all, we, all, we all love immigration, we all love immigrants, we all think that the government is more restricted than it ought to be, but I want you to think of yourselves in this course not as advocates for immigrants, which is a relatively easy task, that is to say for for a law lawyer or a law student, you know, you make the best case you can for the particular individual whom you're representing. That's your ethical obligation, and that's uh, the system is set up so that that's uh, that's a, a valid, indeed, essential uh, uh, office. Uh, but I want you to think of yourselves as people who are responsible for the effective functioning of the immigration system. Now, this is not a particularly attractive role for people to play. You know, you know I'm going to be I'm going to be a bureaucrat, I'm going to be a technocrat, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be one of those people in Washington who doesn't care at all about the individuals whose lives are deeply affected by uh, the decisions. I said, yeah, I want, you to, I want you to think of yourselves as system designers and system admi administrators. Immigration will never be, uh, will never, uh, uh, be politically, or increased immigration, which I favor, will never be politically acceptable in this country unless people have confidence that the system is working, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that other interests besides the protection of individual clients' uh, claims um, are being respected. And that's going to mean uh, taking decisions that are often inimical to the interests of your particular clients. I want you to keep that in mind. Think of yourselves. Of course, you're going to sympathize with the immigrants in the cases that come before you, and you're going to say, as we all say, gee, you know, this is one individual. Why is the government hassling this one individual? This one individual is going to bring the, uh, the system down if, uh, if uh, he or she is, uh, is uh, uh, given relief from uh, deportation. But think about the larger system of which millions of these, uh, of these uh, decisions uh, are made and the way in which they fit together affects justice in, in, in a bro uh, properly and broadly uh, defined. Um, that's very hard, and I don't think I succeed in that. Uh, and part of that is because of the attraction of the clinics, because the clinics, uh, although I'm sure Dan's clinic and others are, uh, are, are relatively sophisticated about the way they, they present, uh, the problem is still the basic idea is protect your client at all, at all costs within ethical uh, constraints. Um, so, so that's one thing. The second clinic at Yale is uh, the housing clinic, landlord-tenant clinic. And um, here it's uh, very interesting to uh, uh, discuss these issues with my colleague uh, Bob Ellickson, who's probably the leading property scholar and law scholar in the United States. Um, and what he finds is that the clinic often takes positions that are inimical to the long-term interests of tenants, even though they seem to be victories for tenants. And so it, they've made it extremely difficult in New Haven uh, for landlords uh, to um, 
uh, expel uh, tenants who are making life miserable for the other tenants in the, in the area. I've d done a little work with public housing, and uh, I know it's true of public housing projects, it's true of homeless clinics, that a very small number of people uh, can destroy the, the very con already very constrained environment for poor people who are obliged to, uh, to uh, live in those, uh, those institutions. Um, I am confident from my many discussions with Bob Ellickson, who actually spent a semester working with the landlord-tenant clinic uh, because he's so committed to their getting it right, that um, they're not interested in that. They're not interested in the larger effect on, on landlords' willingness to rent to low-income people uh, because of the difficulty of uh, getting rid of the relatively few bad apples. Um, their job is to make it as hard as they can for landlords to, uh, to, take, uh, to take these actions. And I can multiply these examples uh, in, indefinitely. So clinics are great. I'm totally committed to them. But I fear that they exhibit some of the some of the narrowness in perspective that I uh, that I described and uh, deplored. Can I just add yeah. though that there's other kinds of clinic designs, like our juvenile rights advocacy project has an advocacy piece and it has a big policy piece that's going in there and saying let's try to get to root causes and work with um, social workers and empiricists and others to try to improve systems design. So that we go, we think back three. So I think it's that's not inevitable in the clinic environment either. Let me make one response to that. One of the things one learns when one immerses oneself in, in social science literature is that attacking root causes is not always the uh, the best policy. Uh, they're root causes precisely because either we don't understand them, or we don't know how to manipulate them, or they're extremely intractable. Um, and well, sometimes, sometimes it depends on the problem, but sometimes it's much better to deal with symptoms than to deal with root causes uh, in, because the symptoms are, are much more tractable and we can understand them better than we can understand the root causes. That's just a, a, a note of, it's not cynicism, but a, a note of uh, realism. Um, and this is particularly true in the area of criminal justice, which I, I, I'm not, a, not an expert in, but uh, uh, you know, we see we see this playing out in our in the, in the tragic uh, events of the last uh, few weeks. You know, the cops uh, the cops have very little leverage over the root causes of of crime and of uh, misbehavior in in low income communities. They have to deal with the symptoms and leave it to others to deal with the root causes. Which is not to say that they couldn't do their jobs better or be more humane in their uh, interrogation practices and all of that, but. Uh, but root causes are not always the best way to solve a problem. Yes, sir. Go ahead. All right, thanks. Uh, so until your vision takes root, as of today, do you think the government would run more smoothly if there were fewer lawyers in Congress, <laughs> fewer lawyers in the White House, in the State House? That's a great question, and I don't, I really don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I, please understand me. I think. Legal training is absolutely uh, uh, e extraordinarily valuable, and uh, it provides a great education in the way certain aspects of the world work, and it, it increases one's sophistication, one's sensitivity to a variety of social mechanisms. So all that's great, and I'm I'm glad that there are lots of lawyers in uh, in Congress. But I, I don't attribute the problems uh, in Congress to there being too many lawyers there. I doubt, I doubt that that's that's uh, an important explanation. Uh, my question is about legal scholarship. And I know there's recently there was that lengthy series of New York Times articles that was very critical of law schools and also of legal scholarship. And I'm interested in furthering your vision whether you think that the current system where uh, law professors spend a significant chunk of their time writing articles and getting articles published in non peer reviewed, student run, law reviews at different schools, whether you think that uh, serves your vision, and if not, how would you change it? Another good question. Uh, I think most of that scholarship is, well, uh, we, have to dis we have to distinguish between, uh, between a, a certain uh, percentage of, uh, of the legal scholarship that uh, emerges from law schools that is focused on courts, uh, and as I suspect, fairly valuable to judges. 
and to, and to lawyers who litigate uh, before uh, courts. Um, those tend to be lower prestige schools and lower prestige professors, so there's a kind of irony, a cruel irony there, that the people who are doing uh, some of the work that's most useful uh, to, uh, the legal, to legal institutions uh, are not uh, being as amply rewarded for it as people who are writing much more theoretical, high-blown uh, uh, um, stuff. And I think most of that is worthless. Um, you know, I, 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 I read it sometimes, and uh, I, you know, I've used it sometimes. But by and large, it's at a level of abstraction, and it's, that, that isn't very useful for problem solving. And it's, um, it's very tendentious. That is to say, it's not analytical. It's, 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 it's argumentative. It's, 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 uh, it's the kind of, it's the kind of um, uh, work that in, in a courtroom would be called advocacy. And uh, because it's advocacy and because there is such an impulse to uh, to make a big splash with it so that it could be published in the Harvard Law Review uh, 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 rather than a, a lower-ranked uh, law review, um, there is, uh, there's an impulse to uh, make it, uh, uh, to, 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 to not address the complications with it. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't have much regard for that. I think the people who are putting it out are very, very smart people. I have no, no question about that. And they'll be, they'll be, they'd be top-rate judges or, uh, or, or business people or whatever they did, because uh, many of them are quite, uh, quite brilliant minds. But I don't think it, uh, it has much social value at all. And it diverts. It, it, I think it corrupts. That's too strong a word, but I'll use it anyway. It corrupts the incentive systems for young scholars who see that as their, as their model to tenure and to, and to distinction. As the potential dean, you have said nothing about the chaotic circus of politics today in Washington. And it seems to me that would be, and also the media. It would seem to me a lawyer today or a political scientist has to figure out how to take what we do in seminars and get it through the craziness, the dysfunctionality. Well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, I, I don't think much of what we do in, in, in law schools ought to be adopted in public policy. I, I, it seems to me there's a disconnect there. The, the job, the office of law schools ought to be to train people to think clearly in the, in the most obvious and simplistic formulation. Uh, and what they do with that knowledge is dependent on lots of different things and, uh, and one can and probably ought to disagree with a lot of the positions that people who are so trained will ultimately take. That's an entirely separate process. I don't mean to, 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 to talk too much, but uh, I think that I at law school should have been taught how to take an argument that was sound and try to force it through the corridors of power. And I never had any idea. I, uh, but, but you saw in the 60s, that's, that's what people... I don't tried. think that's realistic. I, I mean, I think politics... Of, Professor Melnick has been a, actually been a state legislator, so he's closer to this than uh, most of us, or was closer to this than most of us. Have been, but that's not the way politics works at all. It's not a question of good ideas uh, 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 presenting themselves and then being and then being pushed through by zealous uh, by zealous uh, professors or, or or law graduates. Uh, it's a very complicated process. Professor Schlossman has uh, written a, a justly celebrated book uh, called the Unheavenly Chorus. Did I have that right, or is it the Heavenly Chorus? <laughs> the Unheavenly Chorus yeah. about how this about how this uh, process actually works. So I don't know that we could, I don't know that law schools could or should be in the business of training people how to lobby, for example. That's something you pick up once you get out there and, uh, and, and uh, have clients and or work for members uh, of a legislature or, uh, uh, or uh, are, are politically, politically active. I think most, and most lawyers have no interest in that. Yes, sir. I'm interested in the fact that the three examples of the formalistic role of the lawyers in the government, uh, those being the Golden Rights Act, uh, the HEW experience, and then the housing initiative, um, all 
I think if I heard you right, they were producing a more radical change in an existing order. And, and, and I think in your theory, they weren't taking it sufficiently into account other factors. Well, in, in the research for the book, though, did you talk to uh, public lawyers who viewed their role as different, that they thought of themselves as the Burkeans, that they, they thought of themselves as stopping the social activist policymakers from cutting down the whole forest. Because it seemed that your examples were using formalism to describe the more activist role for the, for the lawyers. Well, I, I, uh, maybe it seemed that way. That was certainly not my intent. I, I could have selected other, uh, other examples. Um, no, it's, uh, it's not a question of, act, of left versus right or activism versus, uh, uh, versus uh, inertia. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, an, it's an approach to understanding the world in as much of its complexity as we can grasp, which is not to say all of its complexity, because most of it we can't grasp. Um, that's really all I'm saying. And I think lawyers need to uh, uh, be trained uh, to do that more than they, they do now. Um, Shep? Yeah, I just want to give you a chance to plug your book for um, <laughs> right. it. If, if you can get people in the audience either to read one chapter or to appreciate one argument you make, what, what would you like them to come away with? Well, uh, uh, there, there are two chapters that uh, should be of particular interest to lawyers, three chapters really, but one of them, if you've taken administrative law, uh, you may uh, understand uh, uh, reasonably well. That's a chapter on the policy-making process itself. But the other two uh, is a chapter on the limits of law, uh, by which I mean the inherent limits of law, by which I mean those aspects of law that are I inescapable when you use law as the vehicle for public policy, which is to say virtually all public policy. I was trying to think of public policy that is not uh, made through law, and the only one I can think of is a jawboning by the by the president, or, or, or uh, there's some famous examples of this. But basically, law is is the lingua franca of uh, of policy, and uh, so these entailments of uh, of law uh, are uh, are inescapable. And um, uh, some of them are very valuable, and some of them are very costly, and some of them are both. So due process is an example of both. Uh, procedures to assure uh, that. Decision makers have good information. This procedure is designed to protect the dignity of, of those who are uh, 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 taking a position uh, before the government. Procedures designed to limit the discretion of, uh, of powerful uh, decision makers. Uh, these procedures are uh, all have uh, obviously desirable goals. Um, and I'm not in any way suggesting that they ought to be abandoned simply because they're costly. But there is a trade-off there, and it's a very, it's a very tragic trade-off, uh, not only because it imposed costs uh, on, uh, uh, in, in some of the other, in some of the obvious uh, arenas, such as cost, cost the courts of adjudicating uh, these matters, of many of which have nothing to do with the merits of the case, but are s simply procedural jousting. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but also because the, the extraordinarily uh, intricate procedural apparatus that operates uh, also has effect on substantive outcomes, serious effects on substantive outcome. So, for example, uh, we should understand, I hope you do understand as law students, uh, that uh, procedures are a tactical device. Uh, the elaboration of procedures uh, g gives uh, a greater strength to certain interests rather than other interests, and those interests are not always aligned with what we might think is the fairest uh, distribution of uh, power in our society. Um, and so j j just as that example, because I'm running short of time and, and uh, w uh, need to use shortcuts, um, uh, procedural procedures are... Uh, uh, create opportunity, tactical opportunities for, uh, for lawyers uh, uh, that may redound to the detriment of interests that we might believe are uh, most, uh, uh, most valuable for society. Now that's, 
Let me give you an example, because the most obvious counterexample of that would be in immigration, for example, where you have the government uh, against a, an individual uh, who's attempting to uh, defeat deportation or, uh, or, or enter the country, and the government has some rule or, or discretion that uh, seeks to keep her out. Um, so that might be a, a situation in which if the person is in the country and wants to remain in the country, procedures are great because you just delay as long as you can uh, uh, so that the person can remain in the country and hopefully gain legal status during, uh, during, her, uh, during her stay. Um, but what that means is that there are second and third order effects of that. Uh, so what happens, Congress enacts a law in 1996 which strips immigrants of some of those procedural protections because it perceives that the, that the system is, is log jammed because the system is just overwhelmed and uh, in response to that over, that the, the, the sheer numbers of the situation, the government is being forced to detain people that it wouldn't otherwise have to detain. Uh, the government is being forced to uh, uh, consider uh, legalization of people whom it might not otherwise legalize, and a whole variety of second and third order effects that um, uh, seem very distant from the tactical uh, objective that the, uh, the immigrant's lawyer had in, in seeking to invoke those procedures and layer them uh, further in order to protect, uh, protect the client. That's just an example. Maybe it's not the best example. but. Um, uh, but the more general point was that uh, uh, procedural due process is one of those features of law that limit its eff efficacy even as it protects important uh, social and uh, rule of law uh, values. Um, uh, another is the uh, is delay, which is, which is linked, to, uh, linked to procedures. Um, and so I go through a variety of these. So uh, another one is what I call the simple simplicity complexity trade-off that's inherent in law, that the formulation of a rule necessarily uh, has to choose where on the spectrum between simplicity and complexity a particular rule will, uh, will lie. And uh, that's a very fateful choice uh, in terms of uh, how that law is actually going to be implemented in the real world. So that's a chapter I would emphasize. Another chapter I would emphasize is um, on markets. And one of the strong arguments I make in the book is that markets systematically and powerfully undermine the coherence and effectiveness of public policy. Uh, again, it's a, at least a two-edged sword, maybe a three-edged sword. Markets are very valuable. They're, they're, they're crucial to uh, our liberty and to our, uh, and to our uh, uh, productivity, uh, but um, markets in a variety of ways undermine uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, public policy. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons which I discuss. One of them is that markets are just a lot faster and in many ways smarter than government processes. So markets are very nimble and it's very difficult, if not impossible, for policymakers to design re governance regimes that will, uh, that will keep up with the markets. Another thing is that markets go across jurisdictional lines. They operate nationally or internationally, uh, whereas law operates within particular jurisdictions. So you have uh, uh, black markets uh, uh, arising all the time, whereby market actors can escape the constraints of a particular um, a particular uh, state. Now, one response to that would be, okay, let's go up a level from state regulation to federal regulation. But there, there are uh, there are other uh, uh, trade-offs uh, to be confronted. So, understanding how markets work and understanding how markets interact with the policy-making apparatus is really crucial. And I don't think uh, I don't think uh, law students or people generally uh, appreciate that. Um, so those are, those are the chapters I probably recommend most for, uh, for uh, law students. Yes? It sounds like a theme, maybe, uh, that is running throughout your comments it, it is perhaps that there's a irresolvable, uh, unresolvable conflict between the lawyer with fiduciary duty representing an individual client uh, 
and making good poli public policy for society as a whole, or even for that, for, for kind of a class of those types of clients as a whole when, when you think into the future. Um, so for instance, if you're talking about their housing clinic where you're saying that clinicians are sometimes pressing for things that aren't to the benefit of people in public housing as a whole, um, but nonetheless, they have a fiduciary duty to do what's best for that individual client. And, and there's, unless we change the fundamental relationship, that that is what it is. So I wonder what the, if I'm understanding you correctly, I wonder what that fallout of that is. Is some of it that we should be more sus, more skeptical or, or more worried about public policy change that really comes from kind of uh, Litigation, or especially advocacy litigation, where you're kind of representing supposedly the interests of a class, but you really have individual clients uh, that, you're, that you're also. Well, there's with. several implications of this. Uh, I'm going to speak quickly because I'm getting out of time. One is that I would like advocates to be better read and, and more sophisticated uh, before they adopt, before they formulate and adopt, and then promote their uh, advocacy positions. Now, it might not change very much because a lot of them are being paid to advocate positions that their clients that their clients want, and uh, so that, you know, that, that's, a limited, that's a limited remedy. Uh, but uh, especially those who purport to speak for the public interest and don't have uh, clients to whom they are indentured uh, uh, ought, to, ought, to be, uh, ought to be more capacious in their understanding of what their job is. Uh, that's one thing. Um, secondly, uh, is the adversary system, and uh, uh, Bob Kagan has written a, a Great book about adversarial legalism. It's sort of inherent. It's sort of inherent in our process. Uh, there are many good things about the adversarial system, but uh, uh, there are many costs to it uh, as well. The inquisitorial system uh, that prevails in civil law jurisdictions uh, uh, has its own strengths and weaknesses, and some of the some of the problems in our system uh, would probably be remedied by moving to an inquisitorial system. Uh, my colleague at Yale, John Langbein, is a very strong proponent of uh, this in the area of, of criminal law. But, you know, who knows? That's, that's an extraordinarily broad <coughs> policy question that I would, not, uh, would, I would not entertain, much less offer an answer to. Indeed, in, in my chapter on remedies, I begin by saying that um, there are lots of uh, uh, attractive ways to approach some of the problems that I've delineated in the uh, first uh, 11 chapters, but uh, uh, I'm an incrementalist, and I'm an incre incrementalist uh, by temperament, but also by conviction, um, uh, partly uh, because I was impressed and subsequent experience has validated uh, the insights of the same Aaron Woldowski, uh, who, wrote a great, uh, who wrote a great article that everybody should be required to read. Um, uh, about the, called The Science of Muddling Through. This is 60 years ago. Uh, in which he explains the virtues of incrementalism as distinguished from comprehensive synoptic uh, thinking about, uh, about uh, uh, problems. Uh, and I'm very much an incrementalist, so I eschew some of the ostensibly attractive proposals to, uh, to uh, um, repair our system or replace our system by something else. So, my colleague at Yale, Bruce Ackerman, has argued that we ought to move to a parliamentary system, Westminster system. Um, and there's a lot to be said for parliamentary systems if they operate, you know, in, 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 in working democracies uh, with, uh, with the strong party systems and accountability and so forth. But I, I think anybody who proposes such a change is under an enormous obligation to to predict what the consequences of moving from that kind of from our kind of system to that kind of system would be, and I, we don't have a, the foggiest notion of that because it's such a large change. We can't begin to predict what the what the consequences of moving from one thing to another are. I take a less elevated uh, question: um, the line item veto. Now here's a here's a remedy that might seem very attractive. I believe that every state. Uh, almost every state uh, gives its governors a line item veto. So you might say, well, it works there. Uh, 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 it, it ought to work uh, uh, at the federal level. But that doesn't necessarily follow. There is a very, very different system. And the relationships between Congress and the president and between both of them and the bureaucracy are very intricate. And uh, uh, 
changing something as fundamental as the line out of Vita would alter the power relationships among those three uh, institutions in profound ways. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting we ought not to consider such large changes, but I am a bit uh, humble in my willingness to, to um, pontificate about what the, you know, what the likely consequences of, of that are. So I limit myself to what I call cross-cutting cross -cutting reforms. That is, those that would apply to programs across the board, because if, if in order to reform the tax system, you have to be a tax lawyer and you have to study very, very deeply. I'm not and haven't. And so uh, I, you know, I, 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 it would be irresponsible to make detailed proposals for change in the tax system. But what I can do and have done is to identify cross-cutting reforms that, uh, that uh, I think all agencies could, uh, could beneficially uh, adopt. They're modest, they're modest reforms. I, in the book, I use the phrase small bore. They're small bore reforms. Um, but I think they are uh, much more achievable and, are, and we're better able to predict that they would improve matters than we are with large scale changes. Well, may, um, we have uh, vowed to be done about now. So maybe I should thank you, but also to invite people to stay around and uh, sure. more questions that people have. So thank you very much.